We have up here, we have Betsy Cooper. She's a policy director at the Aspen Institute, lots of government experience, academic experience. She also, and this is very important, helped Kitty set up her Wi-Fi in, I believe, the Chicago O'Hare Airport <laughs> yesterday. So uh, Betsy is very, very skilled. We have Cassandra Kelly. She's on the EU's Global Tech Pro Panel. She's on numerous boards, an advisor, a speaker, and as we all know now, she worked at Pottinger, in fact, founded it. So please welcome Cassandra and Betsy to the stage. So I think we should begin maybe with a little survey of the audience after watching that. Yeah, Let's I see. agree. Let's All turn right. it back on them. <laughs> How many people here use two-factor authentication? Show of hands. Oh, look at that. All right. How many of you use uh, VPNs? Nice. How many of you have uh, black tape on your laptop camera? Wow, this is pretty good. Um, how many of you use burner phones? <laughs> <laughs> All right. That's impressive. Wait, how many of you know what a burner phone is? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> all right, good. I photographed all of that. Now I know all your vulnerabilities. Um, <laughs> what do you think of those responses? How do you feel about that? Um, not super surprised. I think that, you know, and uh, I should say first, it's wonderful to see Kevin. Uh, we use your security training at the Aspen Institute, so you were literally the first person that I met on my screen uh, when I started. Um, and so a lot of these security programs have been built to teach people the basics, to use two-factor, to have a VPN when you're traveling. And so those basics are starting to spread, and it's great to see that that's not just true in the United States, it's true more broadly. Um, I think when you start getting outside those two or three things that the average person has been told a million times to do, yep. uh, you start to see more problems. And then I'd also say, uh, some people will sometimes say, yes, I know what those things are, but don't always turn it on. So I suppose the follow-up would be, how many of you actually turn on your VPN every single day working at your laptop? <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, so there's a difference between having access to the technology and always using it appropriately. I'm not entirely sure this room is, is representative um, of the people that I'm mostly concerned about, people like I used to be. I think if you can go black hat, white hat, you can go very dumb, less dumb. So I'm hoping <laughs> I'm less dumb now. Um, but, uh, you know, I just feel the people, that have, they self-select to come here. They're interested. Um, they're spending hours listening to it. Um, so there's an awareness that uh, is not present uh, among, you know, the everyday consumer and people that I really worry about. All right, well, let's talk about companies then. Let's talk about what are the things that you think companies, if you were to give a checklist that you think most companies should follow, you both, both work as advisors to lots of executives, lots of boards, what is on your checklist for corporate leaders here? My checklist for corporate leaders. Uh, look, I mean, I really want to start, first of all, understand that it wasn't very long ago with, when I advised boards and senior management that the very people governing sitting on the boards actually couldn't really uh, operate a computer. And I'm actually not joking. Um, and then iPads, fortunately, are intuitive for three-year-olds, but they're also intuitive for aging board directors. Um, <laughs> and so they were given these iPads, you know, they're handed over, and then apps like Diligent and other things have come along to create electronic, effective distribution of board papers. Um, and all of that's been, you know, quite uncomfortable. So that's sort of the, the, what you're really dealing with. And these people govern some of the largest organisations in the world. And yet the level of sophistication on those boards is incredibly low. Um, and uh, so one of the things that I think is incredibly important is for a board to make sure that, and, and an organization is to make sure that they have the requisite skills around the board table so that they know what they're looking for. It doesn't need to be an expert level in every member of the board. Um, but do have that as part of your skills matrix. And many of the skills matrix that I look at when I'm looking at board performance, very few people have had until recently anything to do with having technology, let alone cyber as a core skill that you'd want to have around the actual board table. Um, I think it's great, and uh, I uh, chair a central financing authority um, in Australia, and uh, we do bring in outside people to test. Um, that is actually a core thing of what we do. So it's really important to get external people in, I believe, to attempt to hack your systems. But you do also want some resident experience and don't assume that it is resident in the management and you can be quite confident it's almost non-existent at the board still. And so first stop, 
get that experience right, around so as, as someone on the board of the Central Financing Committee of Australia, what do you most worry about? What is the hack that could most bring Australia down? Uh, I'm very fortunate that I, I worry less about us being hacked in terms of, obviously there's you know, 50 billion here or there and uh, I don't want that to go awry. Um, I really worry <laughs> about hacking of utilities. Mm -hmm. So some of our customers and that the concept that somebody can come in and and shut down water supply, turn off electricity, uh, and really, uh, without even being on the ground, that for me is, is very terrifying. And I don't think people have really got their head around uh, utilities as a target um, in the way that I think they should. So I sit uh, as sitting on a financing authority that um, is effectively the bank to utilities. I worry about our customer. I'd be worried about data manipulation of your finances. So, uh, you know, just forget the large Australian financial system, think about your own personal bank oh, accounts yeah. right now. Any idea how much is in your checking account right now? What if I asked you to go online, check your checking account, and you're pretty confident that wasn't the number that was there yesterday, but you don't have a paper backup to prove how much money you have. Now imagine a hack like that at scale against a major financial institution. The entire bank no longer knows how much money is available. So it's hacks like that that actually petrify me because if you don't have the paper backup or the ability to restore, there's no way to go back to the world you were in before. And that ties into something Gordon Brown said yesterday, which is that the global financial system is much less linked and cooperative than it was in 2008. How worried are you right now that the global financial system is vulnerable to such a hack? You know, I, what I do know is that uh, the individuals working on security, so we have a couple folks who represent that at the Aspen Cyber Group, and they are definitely dedicated to trying to prevent something like that from happening. But as I think we've seen today, it's an offensive-defensive game. Two-factor was seen as the way to protect yourself, and now it's been proven that you can get around that. And the same is true for financial institutions. Right. Each time they think they've found a solution, there will always be somebody trying to undermine that. So let's talk about how a global financial institution can keep itself safe. So obviously you train your employees so they're less susceptible to hacks. Obviously you keep uncorruptible backups, presumably disconnected from the internet, so that if indeed your checking account is manipulated, restore. there is a way to restore it. Right, you don't need to rely on the Ghana, uh, the Ghana, you know, right. the Ghana that example. just happened not to be connected, yeah. Right, you need like sort of power outages in one country around the world every day to make sure all exactly. the companies have backups. Sounds great. Um, you presumably set up your system so that it's relatively easy to tell when there are intrusions. You set permissions so it's incredibly hard for people to get access to data. What else do you need to do? Well, I think you need to build in security into the entire method of your business. So I think historically, uh, and I think this applies beyond financial institutions to almost every business out there, you focus on building a product and getting it out there and growing your market, and then security is baked on on the back end. Mm -hmm. And so I think now security needs to be baked in on the front end so that people are having those conversations. So when you are developing your business, when you're having your go-to-market strategy, when you're thinking about what your next steps will be, you need to have people with security expertise in those conversations to identify the vulnerabilities up front. It's much easier to prepare in advance than to try to stick a Band-Aid on afterwards. Cassandra, you agree? Three more, yeah. It's not an afterthought. I mean, there are so many technologists at the CTO side of it, let alone security and data, who sit there and say, we're, you know, that we're invited into the conversation after the product's been imagined. Um, nobody thought to ask us. So every product team should have a security expert who works on it so that it's not just something you attach at the back end. Or at least a cross-functional team that collaborates on a regular basis. That can't be socially engineered. All right, let's talk about, like, fun, crazy stuff, because otherwise, if we talk too much about hacking the banking system, I'm going to get depressed. Um, Agreed. Betsy, you recently wrote a piece saying that we give up on 2FA. It's time for 3FA, 4FA, 5FA, <laughs> and you suggested brainwaves. So let's go into this. What, what are you talking about? Uh, sure. So uh, in my former life, I worked at UC Berkeley, and we had, uh, you know, I'm sure not as good as at NYU, but we had tremendous faculty uh, there. And we had a team that was working on three-factor authentication using brainwaves. So this ties back to our wonderful conversation about the brain uh, yesterday. So you take a little device. It looks like an earbud, like you would use for your iPhone. You stick it in your ear. 
uh, you create a pass phrase, so a sentence like we were thinking about earlier, and then they've discovered, and this is still in testing phases, but they're getting further along, that if you think the same phrase, you will see a repeatable set of brain waves that you can use. So there's three factors there. The first is the physical device you put in your ear. The second is the sentence that you have to think. And the third is the repeatable pattern of brain waves. So if I have Mary had a little lamb as my passphrase, I can think that, and it'll only allow me to log in if the actual waves There's match. no way that works. Why, why do you say that? We just don't understand enough about brain waves to there to be a repeatable pattern, is, do we? So uh, according to the researchers, I'm not the brain expert. We can find our uh, panelists from yesterday to verify. And yesterday, verify, my understanding is that we were a decade away from telepathy. And so I was thinking about the article that you'd written and, and somewhat relieved in some regards that we're, we're not there yet. But, um. Right, so what you, you wouldn't be able to identify that my phrase is Mary had a little lamb, but you will see up and down lines mm -hmm. that reflect. So if I think Mary had a little lamb, you get a certain set of up and down lines. If I think uh, three blind men, I would get a different set of lines. Um, and so it's not perfect. It would not enable you to know that I was thinking Mary had a little lamb, but it would enable you to know based on my personal brainwave patterns that this was the same phrase that I had thought before. I asked you this question because I thought it would cheer me up, but now all I can think about is what happens when people start hacking my brain waves. Well, so the good thing about this is, unlike many other biometrics, it's changeable. So you can think of a different phrase and they'd have to start from scratch. It's not like the alphabet, whereas if you get all 26 letters, you're good to go. The different patterns will make it much more hard to hack. Less the specific technique, more as we go to read-write access to my brain waves, and as we get closer <laughs> to that, once you're able to write things into my brainwaves, that will lead to amazing social engineering. Absolutely. Are so, there other forms of 3FA that interest you? Um, so that's the main one that I've seen studied so far. I mean, certainly uh, combining biometrics with uh, you know, these sorts of systems is an area of interest, but I think the key point is changeability. So with a lot of biometrics, your fingerprint, your gait, even your facial recognition, if somebody is able to hack that pattern, right. you're done. And so the great thing about something like using brainwaves is it's actually changeable. And so I think we need to focus on new methods of authentication that enable you to move beyond. So the advantage of a fingerprint is that it's not changeable. So as long as it's not hacked, you can continue to use it and be quite secure. Well, I have to unfortunately scare you more. With 3D printing and a little bit of heat, you can already hack fingerprints. Um, there are Japanese researchers took pictures of people doing this. Uh, they zoomed in. They were able to 3D print the fingerprint and they were able to hack. So it's already too late for your fingerprints, I'm sorry. It's OK. I've, I've moved to facial recognition, which I also know is hacked. But it is yeah. super convenient. It's so great. It's um, Cassandra, let's talk about one of your big ideas, which is? Don't have three children. <laughs> you want to hackers? Just have children. <laughs> it is true. When you're they, asleep, you know, it smudges on your phone. They, they do all, all kinds of wonderful, wonderful, fun things with your devices, as I, with somebody with, also with three children, know. Um, you've talked a little bit about the rules we need for um, robots in our future. Obviously, robots and artificial intelligence systems will be a huge part of cybersecurity, offensive, and cyber war. What are these rules? Yeah, I mean, I don't know how many of you read um, a fairly seminal piece, um, Isaac Asimov, um, My Robot, a very old. Um, Book that talks about you know rob robots and at the end of the day robots should create thank you um, robots should create um, no harm they should obey the person who's controlling them and they shouldn't allow themselves to be harmed and obviously we've already got um, drones that break these rules we've got cars that we're programming to choose who to kill so we're already programming robots to kill um, and there's all the ethical dilemmas around it so I think the thing that, I, that keeps me awake at night is, and that we work uh, with one of my colleagues in the room here at the Global Tech Panel, is really on the issue of lethal autonomous weapon systems, or LARS, or whichever acronym you want to use. And um, to be really clear, we've got the automated um, weapons that we've, you know, drones, that requires a human being to um, set the drone in motion or to drive it. Um, set off a missile, but then you've got these autonomous weapons that actually don't need a human. Once you deterministically tell them what the rules are in the program and what their job is, uh, they then go out into whatever their battleground is and decide when you know that program is triggered and when they will 
um, cease and desist, uh, short of there being a kill switch that they just go off and they do that and there's no human sitting um, behind a control panel. And to some extent, landmines have already been autonomous weapons um, and we forget that. Um, but some of what we're considering these days is, is either alarming or um, very alarming. Um, on the one hand, I sort of say to people, which I'm, you know, is to some extent in, in war, um, if you believe, which I don't, that uh, uh, robots can't develop um, forms of psychology and empathy over time, I believe they can. But if you don't believe that they can, then in a war environment, they may not choose to escalate. They may not have the well, they won't have adrenaline running through them. Um, they won't have the passion that may allow them to pull a trigger or do some destruction. Uh, so through using an autonomous weapon, we may actually be able to see more peaceful resolution. But that, you know, some of the rules that we need to consider is that we are not giving the data sets at this point in time sufficient data sets to these robots so that they learn peace that they learn de-escalation. Um, we have a lot of, we have s some footage, and they'll need to see video as well, some footage of what it looks like to choose to um, kill, not kill. Um, uh, we, do we have many examples uh, for them of what peaceful resolution looks, just to stand back and say, you know what, I'm not going to engage. And so there's some really massive questions. OK, so let's take one of those massive questions. Yeah. How do you train a robot how do you train an AI system? Let's imagine it's, it's an offensive cyber weapon, so it's a bunch of code you've injected into uh, an uh, adversary system. How do you program in de-escalation? So uh, one of the ways you can do that, uh, some researchers at Berkeley were focused on this, is to try to infuse the system with human values. So essentially, yeah, it, it's a complex uh, question for sure. Um, but the idea would be that the thing that keeps us from making bad decisions, uh, we make a lot of some bad of decisions, some of us, uh, is that we have a certain set of moral values and that you can actually train a computer to sort of reflect those values. Now, there are all sorts of like questions that underlie that. Whose values? How do you determine which ones? Like Gandhi's or Stalin's, right? Exactly. Um, so it's not to say that that's a simple response, but the underlying question is if you don't do that, then there's no stopping the machine at all. It will continue to go forward with whatever uh, goals you've given it and not have other things in mind, such as de-escalation. Right, and in fact, the example I talked about, this is slightly different, but the ransomware example, it was targeted at a very small area, but because the rule was, if this, then that, it just Correct. expanded to a massive area. So you think there's certain kinds of gates you can put on these systems, certain kinds of rules, and can it, respond to outside events? Can you program that into an offensive weapon? I mean, I think you have to. I mean, certainly it's not a system where it's always just yes or no. There's a, you know, yes, there's a basically a, a list of questions that it follows throughout. And so if it hits a no answer, then it should disable itself. Right. Stop and punching it's, once they've surrendered. Right, right exactly. And, and to some extent, when you're thinking about deterministic AI versus general, I mean, this is some of the other questions we need to grapple with. Are we going to allow you know, the machine learning? So if you take two robots and you teach them the same thing, um, you know, they, they program the same way from the beginning, but you send them out into the world and they have different experiences, technically through the experience of machine learning, they can end, because they've been subject now to new inf different information in different environments, they may learn to respond differently um, and have, and, and so to what extent, when we're talking about lethal autonomous weapons, do we actually want to have the code such that if this, then that, um, they can't actually learn along the way and then um, have a mind unto their own as to how they're going to respond. So there's some really, really big questions around the program. That is, a, that is a big question. We're going to move to questions in, in one minute. Let me ask you a question about that. Do you think that autonomous weapon systems should always have a human in the loop before a kill decision is made? A number of government leaders have said that. Well, is it really autonomous if there's a human in the loop? Or is that really automated? So do you think that autonomous systems should be able to make kill decisions, or do you think that that should stop? Because you shouldn't have an autonomous, you shouldn't have a computer system that can make a kill decision, right? So with the I, United I, States. I think that's correct. I do not think that you should have a computer system that can make a kill decision. Which is the way own. like the US military is set up, right? You can use predator drones, you can use right. AI system to identify targets, but a human has to press the button. Right, so I'm, I'll give an example in a different context, but I think that enlightens this one. So 
Um, in the sport of tennis, uh, there is a computer system called Hawkeye. How many of you are familiar with what Hawkeye is? A handful. So Hawkeye is a system that tells you whether the ball is in or out. And unlike in many other settings, uh, Hawkeye is the default. So if the umpire says the ball is in, Hawkeye says it's out, Hawkeye wins every time the human is overruled. I don't think we want a system in which the human is overruled when it comes to killing people. Except, here's the thing about Hawkeye, it's better than the ump. Only if you believe that Hawkeye is accurate. How many times have you sat watching a tennis match and Never. thought, man, Hawkeye and crushes it. Hawkeye's we, we amazing. We can't even land a plane that's meant to be going to Dusseldorf in Dusseldorf. We're landing it in Edinburgh or wherever. Where did it land in Edinburgh? <laughs> okay, but let's say it improves so much that it is unambiguously the case that Hawkeye is better than the ump every time. Hawkeye it can just still doesn't be get hacked. Did you not listen to Kevin? <laughs> so you okay? So even in that scenario, okay. So what about for a defensive weapon? What about for missile defense systems? Should you have a missile defense system that can shoot just based on the AI system without a human in the loop? Because like well, Hawkeye, we already it's have probably better. Radar detection, we've had that for some time. So there are genuinely autonomous, and I think we need to be really careful because automated, there's a person in the loop at some point, either controlling it or making a decision at some point in time. Autonomous means it is autonomous. You set it off and it goes and it makes decisions. The only thing that you could do if it was malfunctioning or you didn't like what you were seeing was to hit some sort of switch, some, excuse the pun, kill switch. Um, so I just think, you know, let's be a little bit careful when you're talking about, you know, automated versus, in terms Definitely. of the, the principles and the ethics, which is what we're fundamentally working on at the panel, is, you know, absolutely, you know, there are questions of international law, LOAC, you know, how do we abide by already very some sensible standards? Um, how do we not allow this to fall outside? Are there extra standards you need to look at? Um, and people are very often confusing the last man in the loop. I say, let's go back, then let's talk automated. If what we're really saying is we're not comfortable, then we're not comfortable with autonomous weapons. Um, frankly, the whole thing I find um, very disturbing um, because there's you know, uh, the ability for, um, somebody, uh, for a machine to go off and make autonomous decisions does make me anxious, but at the same time, I'm fully aware that humans are far from infallible. And uh, so, um, like we saw, whether it's diagnostics um, and some very simple decisions that we're used to humans making, uh, computers are making them better.